Is that too soft? No, sounds good. Comes up on it. We'll do like one take on a triangle or something. We'll deal with that later. <laughs> Cut that out in post. Hello everyone and welcome. I'm James Milan and this is Talk of the Town. We are here today at the Thompson School uh, to talk to uh, one of the newer teachers here at school at the end of his first semester. Uh, we are in the music room with the music teacher. Um, he, he is Philip Dario Fiorentini and I believe you go by Dario, is that right? Dario is fine, yes. Great, thanks for having us in. And, uh, and basically we just want to take this opportunity as we often do uh, on Talk of the Town to you know, introduce you to the community and the community to you as well and find out really kind of what your journey was to get here, how the experience has been so far and what you've got, what you plan on going forward. So. With that as a preface, let me, uh, let me start by asking you, um, is this your first job as a music teacher? Um, you, you look young enough for that possibly to be so, but I don't know. You're very kind, James, but no, I've been teaching, this is my fifth year teaching now, and I used to teach in uh, Barricka County, uh, just north of Boston. So um, the move to here was in an effort to get closer to Boston, where I do live, and I can't say I'm I say I'm, I'd say I'm very happy here. <laughs> great, and uh, uh, excuse me for failing to, to recognize you as a grizzled vet <laughs> of five years now. Um, so, but this is your second, your second job as a, as, as a teacher, your first exposure to Arlington, I assume. Did you know anything about Arlington before you know, this job came, opening came up? So I grew up just west of here in Concord, Mass. So as a child, actually, there was the long slide playground that I used to love to go <laughs> down that huge long slide built into the hill. So mm -hmm. um, that's about the only exposure I guess I've had besides just driving through and passing through the downtown. So, um, but it is a, it is a good step closer to to Boston than Bill Ricca, that's for sure. Um, have you, has music been part of your life for your whole life? Is this a more of a kind of a recent calling? Tell us a little bit about that. So I guess music's been a huge part of my life, kind of since I was a kid, but in different ways. So way back from when I was five, six years old, it was playing on the piano that um, my mother brought from Mexico. My grandmother was a concert pianist, passed away when I was five actually. But having the piano in the house just allowed me to like twinkle out little tunes and figure out little Mozart melodies just sort of by ear, not exactly perfectly, but having it there as a toy was uh, exposing me to music at a very young age. So that when I got into sort of middle school, I could choose the instrument that I really wanted, which was the drum. So like hitting things. Yeah, that's perfect. Middle I'm sure your mother was delighted. Yeah. <laughs> so that happened, and that came along with like this toy drum set that got me going with grooves and rhythms and that kind of exploration. Uh, and when I got to high school, it was in the high school band that I met. Uh, Al Dentino was my band director in Concord Carlisle High School. So. Uh, and a, a person with some influence, as it turns out, over your over your your professional trajectory. It sounds like. Yeah, and like the the phenomenal music that we would make as a as a school band aside, you know, he was a very delightful person and really made a nice community uh, in this huge school that was like very welcoming to basically everyone. So mm -hmm. I think that was the main attraction for me to uh, become a music educator. And you said to become a music educator. I'm interested to know. Um, was there a time as you're growing up as a kid and you're playing the piano, you're playing the drums, et cetera, you know your grandmother was a concert pianist, et cetera. Did you have aspirations as a performer? Do you still, perhaps? Well, performing is always fun. It depends on the context. You know, a formal piano recital is very different than uh, like a... Um, like festive playing at the house when my mother has company over, you know. So it kind of depends on the context, but um, I can say it's always nice to share music, but I think in the end, it's always gonna be an intrinsic value. I don't mm -hmm. think I'll ever stop playing piano for myself, 
So right. So performance, you know, performance is playing music, of course. And what you're, what I hear you saying is, yeah, within the context of uh, conviviality and you know, and doing it for yourself, et cetera, it makes a lot of sense. Not necessarily did you ever aspire to be a professional musician, per, for instance. Yeah, it's just um, it's important to realize that when you're watching a performance, you're seeing the sum of hundreds of hours and thousands of hours even for some musicians uh, probably spent in solitude, you know, really perfecting that craft. So if you don't enjoy that solitude part of it, then you're not going to be able to do the performance part, mm -hmm. you know. And clearly you, you have staked out your territory here in music education and that is far from, from solitude. Uh, in fact, uh, here we sit in your music room, uh, which is a, a good, a, a, you know, a, a very nice sized space um, and also just very cheerful. Um, and I can just imagine it being filled with lots and lots of very young students. Um, tell us a little bit about your days here. How, how often are the students t getting music in their week? and how often are you teaching throughout the day? So students have class uh, in music about once per week, and that's for 40 minutes each time they come to visit. Uh, and as you can see from my room, I keep it very open because in that 40 minutes we'll do a lot. And typically I'll start with movement, so uh, doing some stretches, and then I do a lot of imaginative movement with younger grades especially but even in upper grades as well, where um, students have to use their imaginations basically to move in meaningful ways. So something that's an example is, we're gonna move around the room and you are an elephant. So it's going to be very, very heavy movements, but your volume level needs to be pianissimo, which means extremely soft. So they see all these interesting combinations of how do you move heavy with a soft touch. So. Um, exercising the mind in that way is important. Uh, we also move on to a lot of singing. Singing is very important because it's direct uh, expression of musical ideas. Um, in upper grades, we'll put that expression onto in instruments, so such as drum, xylophones, metallophones, marimba. Uh, some students have played piano for me a little bit. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, um, that's it's a lot that we cover in that short amount of time each week. Right, and obviously students are always coming in here with lots of energy. I'm sure they get to move around in their classrooms as well, but nothing you know, like the release that they probably find in this, in this particular space. Do you also find that working with elementary school students, clearly what you're choosing to do, um, is, is easier in some ways because they have less self-consciousness than older students might around, say, these movement exercises that you do, et cetera? Um, so that's definitely true, um, where students, students that are younger sort of don't have that um, confidence filter that students tend to develop when they go into like middle school age. But sort of trying to tear that down is something I do with my upper grades and you know it's really you know some students will love to do the performance aspect like we were mentioning before like some students love to share their music and go and like spread it with the world whereas other students definitely prefer to do that sort of solitude thing and it's really about getting each student to form their own relationship with music in a successful way that will make them um, able to express their musicality. What's the hardest thing? about working with this age population? Remembering their names. <laughs> There's about 500 students here, and I think I can probably call out about 250 to 300 of them right now. Mm -hmm. And you're about four months into this task or so? Yeah. Of, of name mm -hmm. memorization. That's not bad. That's, that's pretty good, it <laughs> seems to me. Are you actually seeing, I assume so, that you see all 500 students at one point or another in your week or over a course of time? Yeah, so like I said, it's each class um, will come visit for 40 minutes each week, and then through the week, I'll see all 500 students. Mm -hmm. um, so that does see, I mean, you, you, you put it, you know, facetiously just learning their names being difficult, but that does sound like it would be hard to, uh, you know, to, to feel 
some of the same kind of connection you'd feel if you were seeing people over and over again and a, and a smaller number of them. Um, do, you, do you find that you've, you have, um, or let me ask it this way, what lessons have you already learned relatively early still in your teaching career about what goals are reasonable um, uh, to expect of yourself and of your students um, through your music education that you're giving them? So it's just a lot of multitasking, I guess you could say, James. Um, you know, you need to understand not just like music level because everyone's at a different music level. You know, you, you don't start learning music when you come into my music class at five years old. You start learning music from when you're still in the womb of your mother, you know, is really when it starts. So every child comes in at a vastly different level. I've had five-year-olds that can sing perfectly in tune and five-year-olds who have never tried making a singing sound in their life. So you're differentiating musically pretty much from the get-go in kindergarten all the way up through fifth grade as well. So that's just one aspect. When you take into account um, students with special needs, students with IEPs or 504 plans, with behavioral plans, students that have hard things going at home, you need to take into account like what sort of activities and what sort of participatory um, things can you do in the class that will be beneficial to them. You know, when I choose songs to sing and activities to do, it's not just about doing the song or activity. I also tell a whole lot about the history of the music, where it comes from, what it's about, why are we singing these songs. You need to give the music purpose for it to resonate with children. As you, you know, are getting used to a new school and a new student population, et cetera, um, do you find that your interactions with the students um, are separate from everything that is happening in the rest of the school, or are you being, are, do you have ways to integrate yourself and what you're doing with your your colleagues and what's happening in the classroom, you know, outside of here. Yeah. Um, so, the amount of collaborative time that I get with the colleagues here at the Thompson School is quite limited, actually, uh, and that's just due to scheduling and you know, there's a lot to do in the day and there's just not a lot of time for that. So, um, in regards to um, making things applicable. I would say like just the social emotional learning aspect of it, that's just um, teaching students what it means to you know, act in a society and how to behave as people. Um, you know, just doing very fun team building games. Uh, there's one called the telephone song where you get to call out someone's name and the whole class sings to that person and then that person calls the next person and it's sort of a chain event, mm -hmm. right? And so in the past I've had that going sort of towards the end of the music class so that when the teacher comes in, I'll call out the teacher's name. And then it puts the teacher sort of integrated into our music class for that very brief, you know, mm -hmm. one minute turnover time. Right. But Clearly a small thing, but it, you it know, makes all the uh, difference. Yeah, a lovely little connection there. Mm -hmm. um, many of your colleagues I know have to worry about standards, standards imposed uh, by the state um, for them to reach X, right, in their classes. Um, do you are you do you have to also conform um, to those kinds of things? And what are, if so, what are those standards like? What how is it that the the state or or the Department of Edu Education is measuring the progress of your students? So, yes, we do have to worry about standards. And I'm actually currently in the process of working with um, all the other elementary school teachers in Arlington for music education to develop a curriculum that's um, entirely based on satisfying those standards for Massachusetts. Um, and the way it looks like, the, what we get is a giant document that basically has, um, it's divided into sort of three sections, create, perform, respond, and those sections are then elaborated on in terms of singing, in terms of performing, in terms of playing instruments and then by grade level as well. So like what should a kindergartner be creating musically? What should a fourth grader be um, able to read musically? What should a third grader, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So we're currently 
sort of revamping the curriculum from second grade up. And the way it has to happen is you do second grade, and the following year you can carry that through into third grade, and the following year it's into fourth grade. So it's sort of a long process, but you right. kind of have to do it like that, so you have a baseline. Makes sense. So switching gears, um, you had mentioned earlier that you uh, were interested in moving as you moved from Bill Ricca here to Arlington, that part of the attraction for you was that it was closer to the city. Uh, why is that? Is that? Are you living in the city or where, where are you coming to Arlington from? Uh, I'm currently living in Quincy, uh, which is south of Boston. Uh, so I did grow up near Boston, so I do really like the city. But I'm actually currently living in a boat, so... Uh, is that right? How did that happen? Uh, that was just a question between where did me and my roommate want to move and then we couldn't decide and then we needed something at the time we needed something between Bill Ricca and Rhode Island so we thought the coast had less traffic turns out we were wrong <laughs> <laughs> but one thing led to another and then we ended up buying a boat <laughs> well I know we all know that housing's tough in Boston <laughs> but uh, you've got your own, your own version of that obviously um, anything uh, that you you know I'm sure that our audience would, uh, would be, their interests would be piqued uh, to hear that you, in fact, live on a boat. Anything that you can share, uh, you know, in the form of, hey, this is what I have to deal with all the time, or here's an amusing thing that happens when you live on a boat, something like that that you might share with us? Um, well, my first year, it was, it was a stormy year in the winter, so the in early March, I believe there was a storm that flooded the Seaport District three separate times mm -hmm. on three different high tides. And we basically couldn't go on our boat during that time. So it was me and my roommate and our dog, the big pit bull macho. Uh, we had to basically live in the marina offices for two nights. So, so. they, right, I guess <laughs> you make do as you can and yeah. that was your emergency shelter for for that time. Yeah, aside the storms, you know, when it gets cold enough, you have to take blocks of wood and break the ice around the boat. Um, it's just a bunch of little things that you don't have to do when your house is not afloat. Right, that's, <laughs> uh, absolutely. But, uh, and, and I assume that the boat itself is stationary and remains that way. It's not, or, or are you in fact able to take it out? We've taken it out about 25 to 30 times. Oh, okay. Our favorite trip is to head into Boston right around 5 o'clock. And then so that when you're in the harbor, it's the sunset. And you can see sort of the beautiful Somerville sunset with the pink sky. And then the lights turn on in Boston, and it kind of falls into a night scene. So yeah, that sounds... It's unbeatable, I'll tell you. <laughs> that sounds like a real respite from whatever, uh, you know... Uh, working with 500 kids throughout the week uh, might, you know, might uh, elicit in you that that seems like a good way to let it all go. Um, anything else that you do um, in, in your own life that is, you know, something that is important to you, um, not perhaps totally unrelated to working here at school. Uh, but again, we always like to, to find out a little bit about the folks we're talking to that has nothing to do with what they're doing professionally. Sure, well, I, uh, I'm an aspiring adventurer, so hence the boat life, hence, uh, you know, I've taken trips to Utah and Colorado and Iceland to do backpacking and camping, and I'm an avid mountain biker. I do downhill mountain biking at uh, Highland Mountain Bike is my favorite one. I have the sticker on my car, I believe. <laughs> um, I'm an avid skier, so I'm getting ready for this season and hopefully we'll be spending lots of time up in Maine. <laughs> sounds, sounds good. Um, and also maybe you might want to get out west for the skiing as well, uh, if, if mm -hmm. and when you can. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so last thing, just to bring it right back to, to school again. Um, do you have um, concrete goals for yourself um, at, you know, in this job and over the sense of this career? Um, that you've identified and that you are moving towards? Or is it, is that kind of beside the point and, and really there's enough to worry about on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis? No, there are very concrete goals. Um, you know, I, I kind of teach, I have it in my mind to teach for a 30-year plan, which 
me myself not being 30 years old, <laughs> um, can't say if I'm going to be interested in music when I'm 30, technically, mm -hmm. but I have a strong assumption I will be. And the day that I can teach a kindergarten class for six years and then see them grow up to be 30 and still have music as a strong connection in their life, as a strong backbone for them to be able to um, rely upon, that's when I'll know that I've satisfied my goal. Right, okay, so I just want to make sure I understand. What you're saying is now you, you'll, you get to teach kindergartners, you'll have them for the six years that they're here. When that first class that you've had for the six years they're here gets to be 30 years old or so, so another 15, 20 years after that, um, that's, that is, you know, you'll, you'll feel that kind of, okay, I've, I've, I've accomplished something important here. Yeah, I don't, need to, I don't mean to dive too deep here, but it's really like a cultural shift. You know, I talk to a lot of parents, and I love to talk to parents, actually, and a lot of adults and colleagues, and, you know, I can't tell you how many times I hear, oh, I used to play that, but then this, or, oh, I used to play guitar, and then I don't know how to do it anymore. I haven't played in years, you know. Well, like, why? It must have not been that meaningful to you then, or that important, so. Yeah, well, I have to say that um, that aspiration uh, sounds like a pure teacher to me <laughs> because uh, from my own years of teaching, um, I really recognize in it the fact that you, of course, enjoy the experience that you have with the students who are right in front of you every day and every week. Um, but the idea, the deeper sense that something that you're doing with and for them um, is going to have an impact over time um, in their lives is something that I think all teachers hold very dear. Um, and, uh, and good luck to you with that aspiration. I have the sense, uh, even from our brief chat, that, uh, that that may very well be the case. And that just as your band teacher in high school turned out to uh, have a big effect on your own decisions about what you wanted to do professionally, I wouldn't be surprised at all if you'll find that students come back to you years from now and uh, have something similar to say. I hope so for your sake. Thank you, James. I'm interested to, to th it's interesting to think that um, for you as an adventurer or an inspiring adventurer, as you said, um, and also a musician by calling it by profession, um, how do you balance those things? Do you find that uh, you bring music around with you everywhere you go, including hiking up the mountains. Um, how does that work? Um, well, I think everyone does to a certain extent. Like, music's everywhere in movies, TV shows. There might be music at the beginning of this interview or at the end. Um, but I do know that I've literally carried music. In Utah, when I hiked a you know 13,000-foot mountain, I brought my ukulele with me and then promptly ran out of water, so I thought I'd Made a big mistake there. <laughs> you mean you you're right? The ukulele took up the space it did that the take water up would have. Yes. <laughs> so, but then there's other mountains that are <laughs> not going to work. Yeah, it was not full of water, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, besides just you know listening to a lot of my favorite artists, you know, music it sort of uh, it draws moods. So depending on the mood that I'm in, you know, I'll have classical music or hip hop music or country music or folk music that I listen to and. You know, as a music teacher, I get tons of people that give me music listening suggestions. So I'm happy to say I have a large arsenal of songs that I can choose from to you know, set my mood right. And just out of curiosity, are there any genres, musical genres, in, you know, at this point in, in your life that you would say you really don't appreciate? I don't think I can. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, I have found that when I was your age, I did have, like, no way. Country music, no way. Bluegrass music, no way, et cetera. Yeah. And as I've gotten older, I just realized, man, there's good music in all of these genres, and you just have to find the good stuff. Yeah, well, it's um, not... Th I mean, there's music that I don't like, of course, but there's no music that's not valid, because if it's being made, that means that someone likes it, even if it's just the only, the, the one the person, person that makes it. it. Yeah. If it's meaningful to that one person, <laughs> that's all we need. 
I only use the bottom typically. Okay. Sometimes I'll pop up and hit a side, but.